Hi everyone, Nick here. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to dig into mutual funds, ETFs, and discuss trade-offs to help you determine which is better for you. We're going to discuss details and risks that many people overlook. Understanding these is very important as you build your portfolio for financial independence. This is what we do here on my channel. We go beyond the brief summary and cover foundational knowledge to help you be successful and achieve financial independence. I've packed a lot of value in this video for free. All I ask is that you smash the like button to support free financial education. Mutual funds and ETFs are very similar. ETF is short for exchange traded fund. They both pool money from investors and use it to purchase investments. This is great for you as an investor because you get to invest in a single mutual fund or ETF and get exposure to entire industries, asset classes, and even the entire global stock market in just one fund. These funds can provide the benefit of broad diversification, economies of scale in trading, professional management, and more. Mutual funds are much older, dating back to the 1800s. Mutual funds really started to grow in the 1930s and 40s after the Great Depression. Basically, all of these mutual funds were actively managed by experts that selected stocks to buy and sell on behalf of the investors. In the 1970s, investment research led to a new investing approach called indexing. The first index mutual fund was launched by Vanguard in 1975. The innovation of index mutual funds is that most investors are better off just buying the entire market instead of paying these high fees to a team of experts that try to pick the best stocks. Recent research shows that over 10 year periods, more than 80% of active managers underperform their benchmark index. This is why I generally recommend investors use index funds, whether they're mutual funds or ETFs. Before we get into ETFs, let's discuss how mutual funds work. Mutual funds are simpler than ETFs. Let's say you want to invest $3,000 in an index mutual fund that tracks the entire global stock market. In my opinion, the best fund for this is the Vanguard Total World Stock Index Fund, ticker VTWAX. Your entire stock portfolio could literally be this one fund. I made a video about it, which I'll link up here and below. You would open an account at Vanguard and place a buy order for $3,000. If you place the order before 4 p.m. on a day the markets are open, it should get executed the same day. When the market closes, the fund will calculate its net asset value, or NAV for short. The NAV is the value of all investments the fund holds based on the closing prices of each investment that day. The NAV is used to determine how many shares your $3,000 buys. Now the fund has your cash and can deploy into the portfolio usually the next day. If or when you decide to sell, the reverse happens. This daily batch processing of all trades at once has some advantages. It's simple and you get to buy the fund for its NAV. The limitation here is it only trades once per trading day. This is a challenge that ETFs were created to address. In the early 1990s, the most successful ETF was launched, ticker SPY. It tracks the S&P 500 index. SPY allows investors to buy or sell the S&P 500 index at any time during market hours. Another one of the most popular ETFs, ticker QQQ, tracking the NASDAQ 100, launched during the tech boom in 1999. I also made a video comparing the NASDAQ 100 to the S&P 500 linked up here and below. Ever since, the popularity of ETFs has grown. More money has been flowing into ETFs than index mutual funds. Mutual funds still have more assets overall, but it's shifting. Today, 
There are more than 7,600 ETFs worldwide. Most are index funds, but active ETFs have been becoming more popular. So how do ETFs work? When you buy an ETF on the market, the shares will either come from someone else that is selling or new shares will get created. But as a buyer, you never deal directly with the manager of the ETF. ETF managers only deal with authorized participants, AP for short. These are typically large investment companies and they are allowed to create or redeem blocks of ETF shares. Each day, the ETF manager publishes a list of securities they want in the ETF. This is called the creation basket. The ETF manager doesn't actually trade these securities on the market like a mutual fund would. Instead, the authorized participants manage the trading. If there is enough demand for shares, the AP will buy all the securities in the creation basket and deliver that creation basket to the ETF manager. They'll pay the ETF manager a creation fee. And in return, the ETF manager provides the AP new shares of the ETF. This is typically done in blocks of 50,000 to 200,000 shares. The same process works in reverse. If there are too many ETF shares on the market, the AP can destroy shares by bringing them to the ETF manager. In return, the ETF manager provides the AP securities from the fund, which the AP can then sell in the market. This process is more complicated than mutual funds and it doesn't end here. The cost of all of this is baked into the transaction when you buy or sell shares of an ETF. The first cost is the bid ask spread, which is basically like a small fee that goes to the broker for handling the trade. The second cost is a possible premium or discount from the fund's net asset value, the NAV. Remember with mutual funds, you always get the end of day NAV with ETFs the price deviates from the NAV throughout the day. If it deviates too much, APs can step in to make some money by creating or destroying shares. For popular funds, the price is typically very close to the NAV, but it's possible for funds to drift five to 10% from the NAV. Depending on the precise moment you buy, you could be getting anything from a really bad to a really good deal. While popular funds are typically fine, this does add a possible risk to trading ETFs. How would you feel if you had a bond fund, which you considered low risk and safe, known when you went to sell it, it was trading 5% below NAV. With mutual funds, you don't have to worry about fluctuations from NAV, premiums, or bid-ask spreads. Since the cost of the transactions are all baked into the fund itself. It could be a better deal to buy ETFs if you will hold them for years, but you do need to know what you're doing. It's recommended to use limit orders when trading ETFs and to watch the bid ask spread in premium or discount. Here is an example of the historical bid ask spread and premium and discount from ETF.com for ticker VT the ETF version of the Vanguard Total World Stock Index. You can see how the daily spread changes as well as the premium or discount. Note that this ETF holds 42% international stocks. ETFs that hold international stocks will typically have a wider premium or discount due to international markets opening and closing at different times. Investors in the US speculate on how these stocks would be trading and it ends up getting reflected in the ETF price even though international markets are closed. This fund hasn't had extreme fluctuations, likely because it has reasonable volume. On an average day, $174 million of this ETF's shares are traded. Note the other metrics available here like the creation unit size, the creation unit cost, 
and the average created per day in the past 45 days. The creation unit cost is likely included in the premium to NAV. I would personally be comfortable owning this ETF based on looking at the volume, the spread, and the premium. You can also see the latest premium or discount on Vanguard's page for the ETF. Now that we understand the basics of how mutual funds and ETFs work, let's discuss the main trade-offs. In this table, I'm going to list an attribute of ETFs and mutual funds, and some I'll use text, in others, I'll put a plus or minus to denote where one has a strong advantage over the other. I will use an asterisk where there is a competitive option from a specific fund company. Mutual funds are simpler. You always trade at NAV, but the trades only execute once per day at market close. ETFs let you trade during the entire market trading session, but they are more complex. For instance, you have to watch out for the risk of the price drifting from NAV. I think this is actually adding behavioral risk to ETFs, since you're more involved in every trade. You're more likely to engage in market timing if you see the price going up or down when you go to buy or sell. Mutual funds often have a minimum for your initial investment. At Vanguard, this is usually $3,000. If you don't have $3,000, you could start at Fidelity, which has no minimum on many of their index funds. Or you could buy ETFs, since you can buy a single share. A single share of VT trades for $105.30 as of September 23rd. Some brokerages will even let you buy fractional shares of ETFs. Fidelity is such a brokerage. One major benefit of mutual funds is automated investments or withdrawals. You could set up a weekly or monthly trade. Even if ETFs offer this, it might not be a good idea due to the constantly changing bid-ask spread and premium or discount. One major benefit of ETFs is tax efficiency. Due to the way ETFs handle destroying shares, by delivering the shares to the AP instead of selling them on the market, they can avoid realizing capital gains for their investors. There is one exception, and this is for Vanguard mutual funds that have ETF share classes. Vanguard has a patent that allows these funds to share the tax benefits of the ETF. Plus, Vanguard will let you convert these mutual funds to ETFs with no tax consequences. This is one reason why Vanguard mutual funds are so great. The annual expense ratio of ETFs is typically lower, but you do have to pay the bid-ask spread and possibly a premium to NAV. I think for most Vanguard funds, the ETF will often be less costly after holding for a couple years, even after counting the premium to NAV. Then every year you hold them, you come out a little further ahead than the mutual funds. Fidelity also has some extremely low cost mutual funds that are cheaper than many ETFs. Some even have a 0% fee. I made a video on these, which I'll link up here and below. ETFs can be bought or sold at any brokerage for low costs. This can enable you to take advantage of broker transfer bonuses, which can get up to a couple thousand dollars. It can also enable you to access a wider variety of funds from a single brokerage. You won't be limited to the funds from your preferred fund company. This could be beneficial for people that want more options for things like factor investing or tax loss harvesting pairs. I'm marking this with an asterisk for mutual funds because there are already good variety and I don't think most people need more than a few funds. ETFs also have derivatives like options or other more complex financial instruments that some investors like to use. I think this is gambling and a bad idea for most investors, but to each their own. It doesn't stop here. These are the main high level trade-offs. We could go into many more details. ETFs have potential for more risks than mutual funds. 
which most investors are probably completely unaware of. Let me share a couple with you just to illustrate a point. ETFs have five different legal structures that change the rules they have to follow. For example, two of the popular S&P 500 ETFs, SPY and IVV, have different legal structures. The structure for SPY prevents it from reinvesting dividends before paying them out to investors, while IVV's legal structure allows it. This affects the performance of these funds. Different legal structures and asset classes can also affect your tax exposure. I won't get into these details here. One of the most risky ETF structures is called an exchange traded note, ETN for short. These are effectively unsecured debt. You're basically loaning the issuer money and only have their promise to get it back. If the issuer of the ETN goes bankrupt, holders of ETNs could face a 100% loss. Lehman Brothers had ETNs when it went bankrupt. ETFs tracking commodities or other niche asset classes can have different risks I didn't even cover. I'm not trying to scare you away from investing in ETFs. A lot of these risks are fairly minimal or specific to more niche ETFs. They can be partially mitigated if you stick to the more popular stock ETFs, know how to follow the bid-ask and premium spreads, and know how to place limit orders. You'll probably be fine if you dig in a little and figure it out. Just know there are more complexities to ETFs than most people are aware of. The same probably goes for mutual funds, but ETFs have a little more complexity overall. If you want more details, I recommend reading the SEC's bulletin on ETFs. If you want to go even more detailed than that, there is a free Kindle book called A Comprehensive Guide to Exchange Traded Funds. I'll link these down below. Even though cutting costs is one of my favorite things to do, I prefer the simplicity of automated investment or withdrawals that you get with mutual funds. I can set up a monthly trade and know it will execute at NAV. There is much less behavioral risk for the temptation to market time my investments. I use Vanguard funds in my taxable account for their tax efficiency. You may value some aspects of ETFs more than me. And I think you can be successful either way. Could be fine to own both mutual funds and ETFs in your portfolio. There may be a great ETF you want that doesn't have a mutual fund equivalent. I just think you need to be aware of the trade-offs and possible risks. Thanks for watching everyone. If you got value from this video, make sure to like and subscribe to support free financial education. Later.